Good morning and uh, welcome. This is your first time you're doing uh, your clinical methods in ENT, as I try it. And uh, what uh, I'd like to do this morning is to go through some of the kind of specialized instruments we use in ENT um, and give you, introduce you to them, show you how to use them. Um, and then I will demonstrate a couple of uh, tricks and uh, um, procedures that you need to be able to do. Um, and then you're going to divide up into small groups and uh, be allocated a set of instruments um, and uh, otoscopes and headlamps. And then I want you to practice on each other for about 20 minutes. And then we're going to give you patience for, for the rest of the morning for you guys to examine and, uh, and present. Okay. So in all your time at medical school, I think you guys spend uh, essentially one week in ENT out of the whole, I don't know, you guys are on the six-year plan at the moment. All right. Um, and I know you probably find that every single subspeciality says uh, their stuff's the most important, the obstetricians or the primary healthcare physicians. But uh, I would like to also stake the ENT claim that this is the most important uh, topic that you're going to be um, learning. And the reason is just that you spend so little time um, with us in the subspeciality and uh, if you think about it, what is like the most commonest malady that affects humankind? Maybe you could... Uh, it's sore throat. Yeah, the common cold. Eh? How does a common cold present? He's told us one presenting complaint, a sore throat. Anything else? Think back to the last time you had a sore throat. You have... Can you have some on both throats? Okay, yeah, you can do occasionally. Do you have anything more? Runny nose. nose, blocked nose, okay. Anything more? Headache. Yeah, yeah, you get the systemic headache, myalgia, fever, and all that. You can add anything. Well, in children, they frequently get ear infections. So, basically, the commonest malady that you are going to be seeing in your rooms as a primary health care physician, the patients are going to be expecting you to look in their throat, look up their nose, and frequently look in their ears. Now, these are difficult places to look down and see, especially in the children. They're crying and they're wiggling and they're sick and they're uncomfortable. So frequently you're only going to get a brief glimpse of what's happening down the ear canal or what's up going on up the nose. So fortunately, uh, it's a self-resolving illness and there isn't really much you're going to do about it in any case. But Frequently, there are going to be times when you're going to be presented with the pathology that you need to be able to diagnose and uh, see what's going on. And uh, the, as you're aware, the ear canal is down at the end of a um, long, dark hole. So is the nose, two cavities, um, also dark in the oral cavity. So unless you get light down there and uh, see what's going on, you're not going to be able to make a diagnosis. And that's where the headlamp comes into to play. Now, I've noticed, and I know when I was a student as well, I felt very self-conscious when I started putting one of these things on. It made you look like a real nunu, you know. But if you think about uh, the old cartoon GPs back in, like, the 50s and the 60s, they always had this, like, headband on with this funny mirror. Do you guys remember that? You remember that? So, so in the old days, all the GPs had their, um, had their headlamps. That mirror, they would swing down in front of the eye, and then they would have, at the end of the desk, uh, a lamp that was focused on that mirror, and it would reflect light down um, whatever cavity they were examining. So in those days, all the GPs had uh, a type of headlamp. Nowadays, those things have gone completely out of fashion. But unfortunately, amongst GPs, um, the headlamps still really haven't been, been taken up. And they're very useful, not only for ENT, but uh, your obstetric and gynae practice or, or proctoscopies, whatever you're doing, to have a headlamp that provides good illumination of a cavity and gives both hands free is very useful. So this is a, a basic headlamp. As you can see, they, uh, they've stood the test of time. This one does seem to be working. They turn on and off by you sliding this connector up 
and down at the back. You can see the lights on, slide it up, that's now off. All right. They plug in at the wall. There's a transformer there. So um, uh, if there are problems with it, just check that uh, the wall electricity is on. There's a bulb, uh, uh, there's a lens at the end, which can come on and off. If your um, uh, headlamp is not working, just check the bulb that it's screwed in properly. That's the one place that frequently um, problems occur. The other place is that there isn't a good connection at this point. You'll also get to, to practice using these headlamps when you're on the field trip. There is a wheel here which you can loosen um, and uh, you can change the diameter of, of the headlamp. And uh, so what I would like you to do when you practice with it is set it so that the headlamp is sitting firmly on your forehead just above your eyes. And this is called a swan neck. Articulate it so that it's illuminating uh, an area right in front of you. And a good way to check that, it, that it's in a good working position is bring your elbows in by your sides, cross your hands, and then maneuver the swan neck so your hands are illuminated uh, right in front of you. So now your head's in a uh, uh, nice, comfortable position and you can work and do whatever it is you need. All too often you'll see a student trying to examine the oral cavity and the headlamp shining up on the ceiling, whatever, and they wonder why they can't see what's going on. All right, so that's the, the headlamp. So I all want you later on to practice putting this on and off at, um, and looking down uh, the oral cavity or the, up into the nose using the, um, the headlamp. Any questions you guys got so far? Pretty straightforward, eh? Then the other thing is uh, the otoscope, um, specifically for looking down the, the ears. Here we have got wall-mounted otoscopes because we obviously look down a lot of ears in this clinic. Um, but when you guys uh, perhaps purchase your own equipment, um, you probably won't uh, have a wall-mounted uh, um, thing unless you're always going to be in your own rooms. Um, you'll probably buy um, a battery-powered uh, um, otoscope. And I would recommend the one that's got the charger that sits on the, on the table and you just like drop it in when you're not using it. Um, and then it's already charged. So if you go up to the ward to see a child or um, it's, it's just available and, and recharged and all ready for you to use. Um, it's got a magnifying glass on this side which you can slide open and uh, close like that. Um, sometimes if you can't see what's going on just check that that's cleaned. Often people use it to actually look up the nasal cavity. Um, it's quite useful, especially in children, because that's about the, the aperture of, of a child's nasal cavity as well. But just remember when they exhale that the um, condensation is going to um, obscure your view on the, on the uh, little magnifying glass. You'll see that there's also this attachment here. Where, which fits onto the side of the otoscope. You just squeeze it on. This is a pneumatic bulb, which when you squeeze, it uh, uh, insufflates air down the, um, the otoscope so you can assess the mobility of the tympanic membrane in relation to changes in pressure in the outside ear canal. So kind of the first thing you need to consider when you're doing your otoscopy is what size speculum you're going to attach to, to your otoscope. And here you can see that there is a selection of sizes. Um, they're, they're quite simply fit on just by squeezing and twisting it. And then there, there it is on firmly there. Um, now, the principle, one of the main principles in terms of looking at an eardrum or looking down an ear canal and seeing what's going on is the wider the view you have, the more you're going to see. And the more you see, the, um, the better your diagnosis is going to be. So when you are um, assessing an ear canal, before you actually choose your speculum, which you're going to be putting on there, with your headlamp on, look down at the ear canal and say to yourself, is this a wide, big, open ear canal, or is this a narrow, small um, ear canal? And everyone's got different ear canals. This is we've all got different noses, we've got different size hands, shoe size, whatever. Everyone's got different ear canals. Everyone's got different eardrums. And this is part of the problem 
you as when you're learning your um, otoscopy that this is not, or looking in the oral cavity or in the nasal cavity, this is not a part of the body you look at frequently. Um, and there is a range of normality. And you need to, after a while, to be able to decide, is this what I'm looking at, a normal ear canal, or is there something going on? Is this a narrow ear canal, because this person just happens to have a narrow ear canal, or is this a narrow ear canal because there is inflammation, edema, or a foreign body, or a tumor, or something else going on there? So you need to practice while you're doing your time in ENT, try to look down as many uh, ears um, and then throats as possible. And then later on in life, whenever you're doing your pediatrics or um, uh, general medicine, uh, take the opportunity, and only really if you've got your otoscope in your pocket, are you really going to um, take the opportunity to look down in people's ears. All right. So look with your headlamp, retract the pinner, and uh, lift the ear canal up, and make a decision as to what size um, speculum you're going to use. And then choose the largest speculum available that will fit comfortably. I'm just going to put this uh, picture up here. Essentially, I just want to demonstrate when you're looking down the ear canal, you know that uh, the lateral one third of the um, canal is cartilaginous and muscle, and then the medial two thirds is bony. So you need to elevate the pinna, straighten out. There's a natural convexity to the ear canal that needs to be um, lifted up and straightened out so you can see right the way down the ear canal to look at the tympanic membrane. And if you've got a nice broad speculum, it will illuminate a wider area of the tympanic membrane so you get more information all at one go. Also, if you have a narrow, small speculum like this, you're going to tend to have to maneuver the speculum around. So if you want to look at the top part of the tympanic membrane, you're going to angle it upwards. Look at the bottom part, you're going to angle it downwards. And every time you wiggle the speculum around, you're going to be banging on the skin of the ear canal, which is adhered directly onto the bone. And as you know from your own shin, where skin is adherent onto periosteum and directly onto bone, it's very tender and very sensitive. So if you are wiggling this around in some child's uh, ear canal, they're just going to scream louder and, uh, and you're going to have a more difficult time. So choice of speculum is, is good, um, uh, is important. And uh, also they turn on and off just when you hang them back up. These bulbs uh, um, are quite expensive and if you leave them lying around while you're working in the clinics, um, they're obviously going to wear out uh, more frequently than, uh, than that. All right, so when you're examining the ear, the important thing is start on the outside, looking at the pinna, looking behind the ear. You'll frequently um, see in our patients that have come, that have had ear surgery, there'll be a scar behind the ear. Um, uh, today, I'm sure you'll all see that. Um, and that's one of our main surgical approaches to, to the middle ear. Um, you want to check the ear canal, you want to assess the patency, um, the health of the skin lining the ear canal, are there any foreign bodies, are there any, is there any discharge. We have got some pictures here, let's move on to this uh, diagram here. Alright, so can you all see this is what a normal eardrum looks like? When you're doing your otoscopy, you are looking at essentially semi-transparent. You can see structures through the, the eardrum. This is a, a right ear. I can tell that uh, due to the angle of the handle of the malleus. The eardrum is intact. There's no perforations. There's no discharge. Um, and generally, that looks healthy. There's no inflammation. There's no redness. And when you do your pneumatic otoscopy, if you get a good seal, that eardrum will gently move in and out. This is of the, the other ear, the left ear. Essentially the same. There's a good light reflex. There's no signs of any inflammation. You get the indication. You, you can see there are structures 
deep to the tympanic membrane, the middle ear structures, um, which are normal and healthy. There's a little bit of scarring of, of the eardrum there. If you move on to some of these other pictures, you can see that that sense of transparency is lost. You can't really see those normal structures through the tympanic membrane. The eardrum is injected. You can see all these blood vessels. There's a lot of inflammation. There's possibly some uh, discharge here, uh, indication of infection. Um, and you can see this thick white pus behind the eardrum. And this patient would be complaining of pain, hearing loss, possible ear discharge, fever. Could well be a three-year-old child with an upper respiratory tract infection that has also got an early acute otitis media. So these are the things you need to be looking out for when you do your pneumatic otoscopy. And it can be difficult, especially when you're first learning. So it's important that you practice um, looking at each, think about exactly what it is you're going to be looking for. What is the ear canal skin doing? What does the tymp tympanic membrane look like? Is it intact or not? If there's a perforation, where is a perforation? Is there a discharge or not, etc., etc. So you need to go and think through um, all the possible things you can see. We can just quickly have a look at some of these. There's uh, um, an air fluid level here, so this is indicating that there's a, a mucus effusion affecting the middle ear, and when you do your pneumatic otoscopy, that eardrum will not move as well as this one would. Here there's multiple bubbles um, behind the um, tympanic membrane. Here there's a lot of inflammation of the, um, the tympanic membrane with the um, acute uh, viral inflammation of the tympanic membrane. If we look at some of these things, you often get foreign bodies, um, often get impacted wax. You'll definitely see some of that today. The ear canal itself can be inflamed, edematous, with this uh, discharge. There's some bits of wax there in the corner. You can frequently get fungal infections, chronic otitis externa, um, and various perforations. So here you've got a a tympanic membrane that's very scarred. There's a lot of scarring going on here with a perforation behind here. A large perforation of this tympanic membrane with a, a mucopyridone discharge. Here's a ventilation tube that's been placed through the tympanic membrane to drain a chronic um, effusion that hasn't resolved by itself. All right, so those are all the things that I want you to be looking out for when you do your pneumatic otoscopy. Um, for when you're working down in the ear canals, oh, we want you to get uh, used to using some of these while you're practicing. Um, wax curettes or Jobson horn probes. Um, very useful for um, gently, this is a, a wax hook. Have a look at that. So with your headlamp on, your patient and yourself seated, um, you can use these to gently maneuver foreign bodies or wax out of the ear canal, especially if they're obscuring your view of the tympanic membrane and you need to be able to see what's going on. So that's called a Jobson horn probe and, and it's hopefully something that you will get to, uh, to know about. We also use uh, suction uh, to clean out discharges. So we'll, we would use a, a suction uh, adapter with a suction tip, such as uh, this here, uh, connected onto this adapter and uh, onto the wall suction. But for you guys in primary health care, that may be a bit more difficult. You won't have these, although they're dirt cheap, you probably won't have access to wall suction. So um, another um, way for you to remove uh, a mucopyridone discharge from an ear canal is to do do either some dry mopping or some syringing. So syringing, which you will learn about on your field trip, um, hopefully get lots of practice at that. And also with dry mopping, um, basically using a cotton wool swab. Um, you can either use wooden uh, orange sticks or um, we can use uh, the end of the Jobson horn probe has got a um, serrated edge. And you can create 
a little soft kind of earbud. Not hard, but absorbent. So with the headlamp on again, retracting, straightening the pinner out, one can gently absorb any excessive discharge. So that's called dry mopping for removing discharge from an ear canal. We also use a number of eardrops down the ear canals. Uh, this is an antibiotic steroid eardrop, and that's uh, basically acetic acid, a vinegar eardrop. Why do you think we use uh, um, acetic acid in the ear canal or in the middle ear when there's uh, a chronic ear infection? Anyone know? Well, it's a type of bacteria. What type of bacteria do you know that uh, doesn't like acidic environments? Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas, yeah. So frequently in the chronic infected ears, they become colonized <coughs> with E. coli, Proteus, Pseudomonas, um, and Staph aureus, low pathogenicity, um, our normal coliforms, our normal kind of body flora. Um, and that's why they don't really respond well to antibiotics, especially oral antibiotics. Oral antibiotics get absorbed and distributed through our whole body, whereas topical drops are applied directly to the, to the area of infection. So topical drops are the way forward. We also use a, a cream, an antibiotic steroid cream, which we can instill down the ear canal with, with a suction tip. And that's also very useful for treating chronic ear infections. All right, so what does the ear do? Transmission of sound. Mm, hearing, anything else? Balance, yeah. So it's essentially, I mean, it's even written, written here, hey? Organs of hearing and balance. Okay, so how are you going to assess the function of the hearing? Let's just put that here. Wonderful stay. What are you going to ask the patient? Yeah, I mean, most patients can uh, tell you, especially ask them about their cell phone. Which ear do you use your phone on? If they've got a unilateral hearing loss, they tend to use the other side. Or they'll say, oh, when my wife's moaning at me or the dog's barking, I'll just roll over and sleep on the other ear and I can't hear what's going on. Um, children, it's more difficult. You need to go into the history more carefully. How they're doing at school? Are the teachers complaining about them? Do they misbehave? Um, are they, uh, is the TV on very loud? When you call them, do they come? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there are other more formal ways of uh, assessing the hearing. Um, and also a useful way of uh, um, making a diagnosis or getting an idea of what the possible cause of hearing loss can be. Do you know any causes of hearing loss? Yeah, I mean, you've got to separate between conductive and sensory neural causes. Excellent, yeah. So essentially there's two big groups, the conductive group, where there's a problem either with the sound waves being transmitted down the ear canal through the tympanic membrane, through the ossicles, and into the cochlea. So that's conductive hearing loss. By far, probably the most common cause of, of hearing loss that we can do something about. Then, as you mentioned, the sensorineural hearing loss, where there's a problem with the, uh, the cochlea, or the nerve, or at, a, at the brain level. Um, and as we age, um, unfortunately, these uh, fine hair cells in the uh, cochlea are very sensitive to, um, to aging and these decrease in number. So, so certainly sensorineural hearing loss due to age, aging is uh, um, a common cause of, of hearing loss. But what we see mostly here that we can do something about um, is conductive hearing loss. So how can you tell the difference between sensorineural and conductive hearing loss? Um, you can use a tuning fork. You can use a tuning fork, absolutely. Certainly your history and all that will, will give you a lot of information. Obviously a child coming, presenting with a discharging ear, is going to be pretty much always a conductive hearing loss. Whereas an elderly person with absolutely normal ears but still can't hear the priest at church has probably got presbycusis, sensorineural hearing loss. So when you're doing your tuning forks, it doesn't really matter what size tuning forks you use. Um, you'll see on our trays there are three different frequencies. 
the starts at a relatively uh, low frequency, 256 hertz, mid frequency is 512, and then a high frequency of 1024 hertz. So I think just for your um, purposes, just use the 512. Um, and explain to the patient what you're going to be doing. Explain to them that you're going to be testing their hearing. I want you to hold the tuning fork uh, on this uh, little flattened bit in the middle there. Don't touch the tines or the base plate while it's vibrating. Otherwise you'll stop it. Um, try to indicate to the patient what sound they're going to hear. So if you push it on the, on the table, that amplifies it. So tell them that's a type of um, sound that they must listen out for. Children, um, say below the age of six, have a lot of difficulty with this abstract concept of this vibration. So certainly don't really uh, try doing tuning forks in children. I don't think you're going to have much success. But uh, um, certainly um, adults, uh, you can explain to them that this is what uh, um, they're going to be experiencing. Um, and then you're going to be comparing the air conduction um, versus the bone conduction. So the air conduction is testing the conductive as well as the sensor neural hearing loss pathways. And it's the most efficient um, pathway uh, for the human being body to hear. So sound waves uh, come down, they're collected via the pinna down the ear canal, vibrate on the tympanic membrane, transmitted through the middle ear with the um, ossicles, the um, malleus incus stapes, and then vibrates the cochlea and stimulate the hair cells. Um, and that's the most efficient way. So when you're checking air conduction, I want you to hold the tines parallel about two centimeters in front of the ear. You'll see on that diagram over there, they, they hold it vertically, but the textbooks say you should hold it um, parallel to the ear canal. And usually, most humans will uh, find that that is where they hear it the loudest. Then when you go into test bone conduction, uh, this is where you are vibrating the skull. Pretty much, uh, when you put it against the skull, the whole skull vibrates. But obviously, the closer cochlea will vibrate more so than the other cochlea on the other side. And so this is uh, direct stimulation of the, um, the cochlea and uh, so in that way you circumnavigating this conductive uh, um, uh, dimension to the hearing. So what you need to do is, is to imagine for bone conduction you're assessing the sensitivities of the two cochlea. When you're putting it behind on the mastoid tip, if you all feel behind your ear here now, You'll, see this little, you'll feel this little bone there. Hey? That's where I want you to press the tuning fork with your other hand to compress the head on the other side and you squeeze it together so that you're vibrating the skull. And that vibrations will stimulate the cochleas. And depending on which cochlea is more sensitive, the patient will tell you, um, I can hear it there. Um, and usually the bone conduction will be less sensitive than air conduction. So this is the so-called Rinner's test, air conduction, yes doctor, I can hear that. Push it against the back, yes doctor, I can hear that. And then you say to them, which one is loudest? This one in front or this one behind? And they'll say, the one in front is louder. So the air conduction is better than bone conduction. And obviously you do that for the one ear, and then you do that for the other ear. And then the, the second uh, tuning fork test, the so-called Weber test, is by placing the vibrating tuning fork on their forehead. Again, compress it against the head and ask them to close their eyes and ask them which side do you hear it loudest in. And uh, they will, if they have got a cochlear problem or a conductive problem, they will say, I hear it louder on this side or I hear it louder on this side. If they've got normal hearing, they will say, I can hear it in both ears equally. I can hear it in the middle, usually. All right. So this is something that uh, you need to practice. Um, it takes a while to develop the concepts of what's happening when you are doing a bone conduction and what's happening when you're doing air conduction. But certainly once you get out there and practice on yourselves, what I want you to do is to block off one ear while you're doing the Weber, open it up, 
block off the other ear while you're doing the web and you'll see the effect a conductive hearing loss has, etc., etc. All right. Ask sure. Test. Yes. Um, what, what kind of pattern would you get with conductive deafness? I think um, what you need to do is to, at this point now, um, is to practice it a bit and try to work it out for yourselves. Okay. Um, it's just that we've got quite a bit to kind of get through it. But it's a very good, good question. Um, but I think it's something also that we will revisit during your um, field trips. During your field trips, you'll go through the whole examination of the ear, um, and we will ask you to demonstrate a, um, um, and you will see a lot of patients with conductive hearing loss, and so you'll get quite practiced at it. All right, so, but otherwise a good question. Okay, so that's the ear. Um, we're going on to the nose. What's the function of the nose? You can tell me. Smell, okay. I think that's the most important function of the nose. Breathing. Breathing, definitely. It's an airway. It's a passage of how air gets from the outside inside. Um, and uh, so that's one of the most common symptoms patients are going to come and present to you with. It's nasal obstruction. May or may not have a rhinorrhea, a nasal discharge. Um, so how can you assess the airway? You can, absolutely, you can look into it, which we're going to do with your headlamp. What else can you do? You can listen to it as well, like you listen. Okay, they're pretty good, both sides, but usually one side of your nasal cavity is not working uh, as much as the other side. What, uh, what else does the nasal, the nasal cavity do? It's an airway, it uh, um, smells, anything else? It's got sort of... Humidity functioning. Excellent, yeah. It warms up the, the air and uh, um, increases the um, amount of water in it, the water vapor. Anything else? Antibacterial. Yeah, it cleans the air. Mm. Yeah, it filters it. Yeah, it, uh, the mucus traps dust, pollen, uh, um, and all those chemical pollutants. Um, so that's hard work. For a nasal cavity. So basically the two sides take turns. It's okay now it's your turn, you sort out the air for a while, I'm going to have a rest and get myself cleaned up. So at any one time there's a natural nasal cycle, it's about two hours, one guy's doing it, two hours, other one's going. So you can usually hear, and also I mean, if you've got a completely blocked nose, you're going to hear someone with a voice like this, which you often do with children with uh, adenoidal hypertrophy. The other thing is the so-called mist test, so like a cold piece of metal. You just ask the patient to blow out on it, and you can see how the, um, the mist is, uh, forms two good uh, um, little shadows on there. It was useful for in children um, who you suspect may have a, a co-anal atresia, a congenital abnormality of the back of the nose. You can also listen with a stethoscope. If you get those cheap stethoscopes, you can just pull the head off, put the earpieces in, and then just put it just next to the nostrils, and you can hear what's going on in the nasal cavity. When it comes to looking in the nasal cavity, you need your headlamp on. Um, simply, you can just gently lift up the, um, the tip of the nose, and then moving your head around, you can get a good view, usually, of what's going on. Um, other things you can do is you can use speculums. Now these are so-called staticum speculums. You can all grab one. You can all practice with, with them a little bit later. Um, sorry, can I use one just to demonstrate here? The way to use them is put your hands up. Let's hope I get this right. Hands up facing the ceiling. Uh, let me just quickly do it. Yeah, okay. So then uh, dangle the staticums on your middle finger and the middle phalanx there. So the blades, if your hand is facing the ceiling, the blades are coming towards you. Blades are going away from you there. All right. And uh, then just gently make a fist. Then rotate your wrist medially. Now your thumb should come over the top. And uh, where you're with, you're, you've, got, you've got a big finger and a small thumb. <laughs> Maybe uh, bring it a uh, tighter fist in your... Yeah, there we go. So you can use this uh, to gently open the cartilaginous ala of the of the nose. Don't use it in an in a AP 
uh, sorry, in a lateral way, because then you have the blades pressing on the septum and on the inferior turbinate. We have got a horrible picture. Okay, so here is the nose, nasal cavity here, you've got your inferior turbinate, this is one of the air conditioning units, and then the midline is the septum, which is covered with mucosa, mucoperichondrium, mucosa attached to cartilage, which is uh, quite sensitive, delicate, whereas this is just skin and cartilage, so it's quite tough. Um, so when you're using these speculums, just use it to gently lift the cartilage upwards and outwards, and you can get a good view into the nasal cavity. And then you can practice for a little while, but you can all go practice in the line. Um, there are other ones. Uh, there was another one here. I can pass those all back. So-called cottle speculum. Again, uh, with your headlamp on, looking down the nasal cavity, you can gently open up the, the nasal cavity. These are uh, so-called uh, Tilly's packing forceps. Very useful for removing foreign bodies. Um, you'll see that they are angled, so your hand is away from your line of vision. So again, with your headlamp on, patient's nose or throat, whatever it is you're working on, just in front of you there like that. Um, for packing ribbon gauze in, for an, in a severe epistaxis, or fishing out foreign bodies, these are, are very useful um, instruments. So those are, we call them Tilly's packing forceps. Just going back to the ear, another instrument I'd like to introduce to you is the crocodiles, crocodile forceps. Also very useful, also angled away, so your hands removed from the uh, uh, sites of vision. And then uh, for f retrieving or placing things in ears or noses and things like that. Um, okay, so when you're looking down the nasal cavity, as we've mentioned, the function is, is may usually an airway, so the common presentation is obstruction. Um, and you need to ascertain is it bilateral, unilateral obstruction. You need to take a history as to how long it's been there for, etc., etc., what other symptoms they're having. Then you need to have a look. You need to check that there is a, an airway doing your mist test. Um, and what you're looking for are any uh, masses, any inflammation, any discharge. Um, and uh, if everything in the front part of the nose looks normal, then usually the obstructions at the back in the post-nasal space, very common in children where they have adenoidal hypertrophy. Um, we frequently use flexible scopes, introduce a, a fine scope towards the back and we can get a good uh, idea of what's going on. But hopefully during your time in the outpatients, you will have patients with nasal obstruction. You can go through um, uh, and we'll also do a flexible endoscopy so you can see all the structures um, and be able to identify that. All right, so any questions about the nose? Okay, the oral cavity. Again, um, you need your headlamp on. On the whole, ENT doctors will use two spatulas, um, essentially just to move all the structures uh, around in the oral cavity. So, so remember the oral cavity starts at the vermilion border um, on the lips, ends at the posterior pharynx. So you need to revise your anatomy of uh, the oral cavity and the oropharynx. So as you examine the, the oral cavity and the oropharynx, you are aware of each structure as you go through. So you start at the front, you examine the lips, the buccal mucosa, so that's the lining of the cheeks, the gingiva, those are the gums, the dentition. You're going to look at the floor of the mouth, the tongue, so both the ventral and the dorsal surfaces, uh, surfaces of the tongue, the hard and soft palate, the pharyngeal walls, tonsillar pillars, so anterior and posterior tonsillar pillars, the tonsils themselves, and then the posterior pharyngeal wall. All right. So you can practice that all on each other and on your uh, patients shortly. Um, the oral cavity, yeah, it's uh, usually that's quite obvious what patients are complaining of. Frequently, patients with ulcers um, and uh, and sores in the mouth, which uh, we may need to biopsy in that. Coming on to 
the hypopharynx, so that's where you drop down into above the esophagus and the larynx itself. That's obviously a difficult place for us to visualize, even with the headlamp, because it's now uh, going down behind the, um, the base of the tongue. So you may see us using uh, um, a laryngeal mirror. And uh, although nowadays with TB and that, we, we're not uh, doing it so, so frequently, we do use flexible scopes more frequently. But just to give you an idea of how the principle works, so you can understand uh, how relatively easy it is for someone who's been trained in ENT to, to do what's called indirect laryngoscopy. I don't think it's a skill you guys really need to acquire, because it does take practice to maintain. And uh, um, I think if in general GP practice, you'll probably find that difficult to, to maintain that. But if you imagine a cold mirror, if someone was to breathe on it, the air would just condense. But if you warm it up, you can either use tap water, warm tap water, or here we just use an alcohol lamp. Just test that it doesn't get too hot. Then when I breathe out on it, there's no condensation. So essentially with the headlamp on, um, so shining down through the patient's oral cavity, ask the patient to open the mouth and stick out the tongue, which I will hold. Basically introduce the mirror at that angle back into the oropharynx. So my light uh, shines onto the mirror, then reflects down through the oropharynx, down to the larynx and the hypopharynx, and then comes back up into the mirror, then into my eye. So I can look, I can actually shine my light down onto the floor, and if you look on the floor, there'll be a little bit of light shining down there. So that's called indirect laryngoscopy, and uh, um, it's the way we visualize the larynx and the pharynx um, if we suspect an abnormality in that region. And how do abnormalities in that region present? You haven't said much this morning. What do you think? I suppose, um, <coughs> well, always coughing, hoarse voice. Hoarse voice. Yeah, I mean, always the best thing to do is think, well, what do those organs do? And obviously the larynx, the larynx is an airway. I mean, that's by far the most important thing. So what happens when you've got uh, problems with the airway? How do people present with airway problems? Is he breathing? Mm-hmm. Um, like a stridor. Yeah, a stridor. So a noisy breathing, essentially. That's perhaps the easiest way to, to say that. So people present with noisy breathing. They may have hoarseness of voice if it's affecting the vocal cords. Do you have any advances, any, anything to add? What else does the throat do? We've got airway and voice. Swallowing, absolutely. So they may complain of uh, a dinophagia or dysphagia, pain on swallowing, difficulty swallowing. Um, yeah, so uh, you can also, again, listen to the airway. Um, and you can get a lot of information as to the quality of the stridor, the quality of the hoarseness of voice, um, the fluctuation in the stridor, is it inspiratory, is it expiratory, is it biphasic. Um, so, but that does come with experience that you, I'm sure you will slowly but surely gain over the time. Okay then, uh, so basically we've been through the ear, nose, oral cavity, throat, um, and now we're coming onto the neck. Uh, the neck frequently uh, presents with neck masses, may have scars and sinuses, um, and uh, so you need to develop a way of examining the neck that uh, you don't miss anything out. And essentially, as with the majority of our clinical examinations, ins inspection and palpation, so you just look at the neck sit in front of the patient, expose uh, the neck to the clavicles, and then when you do your palpation, we like to teach you starting at the front, going along the floor of the mouth, back to the angle of the jaw, so you're palpating the jugular digastric lymph nodes, perhaps the most common lymph nodes that are involved um, in uh, head and neck problems, especially the cancers, then down the sternocleidomastoid. So that's the anterior 
part of your um, uh, posterior triangle, is that not so? And the posterior part of your anterior triangle. So down to the clavicles, then in the floor of the posterior triangle, so along the clavicles to the back, to the trapezius muscle, then palpate up the trapezius muscle. So now you've done the posterior triangle and the posterior part of the anterior triangle, and then palpate down the midline. So you're going to be palpating in the midline the uh, thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, the um, tracheal cartilages. Higher up, you may be able to palpate the hyoid bone, um, as well as feeling for any masses in the thyroid. <coughs> um, and uh, any masses in the midline, you're going to check if it moves on swallowing or not. If it does move on swallowing, it's possibly related to um, a um, thyroid mass. All right. Okay. So I'm just, I've got a great volunteer here. To, I'm just going to show you just one or two little tricks. If you turn your chair towards me, I think if you guys could all come and just stand on the side because... does help if you can see what's going on. All right, so when it comes to using the headlamp and examining the, the ear, so you guys are going to be all very popular, famous practitioners in your area and you're going to be seeing hundreds of patients a day. So you need to make sure that you're comfortable, um, that you're looking after yourself um, and that your patient's comfortable. If it's a child, they need to be restrained correctly so they don't move and all that. All right, so when looking at the, the ears, you want to assess the symmetry on both sides. And you can see how, just turn your head looking over. Here I've got his left ear visible and uh, available for examination. Then look over the other side. Now I've got the right ear without getting up, without moving around. All right, so just look over the other side for me so you guys can see. So when uh, examining the ear with your headlamp, I want you all to inspect behind the ear, make sure they've washed their ears properly. No, <laughs> you're looking for scars, sinuses. This is a mastoid bone, so if there's an acute otitis media that extends to the mastoid air cells, you frequently get swelling and uh, um, pain in that vicinity. With your two hands, right hand gently lifts the pinna upwards and backwards. Left hand uh, retracts the, the tragus forward, then move your head around and shine the light up. Everyone's got different angles, ear canals. You can gently move the he patient's head around. So I push his head away and just with my headlamp, I can look right the way down the ear canal. I can see the tympanic membrane. So just using a headlamp and the naked eye, you can make an assessment of the ear canal. You can make an assessment of the tympanic membrane. There's no signs, in his case, of any inflammation of the ear canal. There's no ear discharge. The tympanic membrane's intact. And that's just using a headlamp. And then the same again on the other side. All right, so I want you guys to practice maneuvering the patient's head around and getting your um, uh, um, visualization of the tympanic membrane. Now I know what size speculum to choose. You know, he's got a pretty normal ear canal. People hold the otoscope in different ways. Um, practice and learn which way is best for you. Uh, another good trick is to just keep your finger out. So just turn your head for me. When, when examining the patient, I've got my uh, finger just resting on his cheek. So say if he's a child and he's fighting and he suddenly turns, my whole hand moves away with him and this doesn't go, get stuck down the ear and make him even more uh, irritable. So again, I hold the pneumatic bulb in my right hand, left finger out, um, pick up the pinna gently upwards and backwards, and then with the um, speculum, pull the tragus forward, look down, and then visualize as you go down into the ear canal and look around. I can see healthy skin and normal tympanic membrane come out. It's got a normal ear. All right. So those are the things you need to, to practice. I just also want to demonstrate uh, the examination of the neck. Um, best to stand behind the patient so that you can palpate evenly and you're also just thinking in your mind what you're feeling. As you're coming along the floor of the mouth, 
down sternocleidomastoid, down to the clavicles, along the clavicles posterior triangle, up the trapezius. That's the end of the um, posterior triangle. Then palpate the anterior compartment as well. All right. Do you guys have any questions at all? Okay. So you've got uh, 20 minutes or so, and you divide up into two groups. Half of you can stay here, and the other half can go next door. And uh, you use all the instruments. Practice your headlamp, uh, otoscope, tuning forks, looking in the nose, looking in the oral cavity and palpation. All right. Thanks very much. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.